This moment we just read about just now in the gospel is referred to as the transfiguration of Christ. And the word to transfigure means to a change in appearance to become more beautiful or to an elevated state. The question is, what did it? What caused Jesus to become transfigured when he went onto this mountaintop to pray? It reminded me of a story I once read about a Jewish man who was at one point living in a concentration camp in World War II. And the guards, it was in the middle of winter, and they led him out in the middle of the night to go hiking through the snow and the ice. And pretty much if you fell and you couldn't give up, get up, they would just leave you there. So his comrades, they were holding on to each other, and they were just trying to ponder different questions to keep themselves alert. And this man in this moment began to ask himself, Who are we? What is man? And what is our salvation? What are we made for? And at that moment, he looked up into the sky in the middle of this night in Auschwitz, and he saw the image of his wife, who he knew had just been killed a couple months before in another camp. But he began to contemplate her face above and all the love that they had shared throughout their life. And he said at that moment, he felt his whole being become filled with light, even in the midst of that darkness. And years later, when he wrote a memoir, he wrote about that experience he had. He said, in that moment, a thought transfixed me. For the first time in my life, I saw the truth, as it is said in a song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers. The truth that love is the ultimate and the highest goal to which man can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought have to impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. What he came to see was that In the final analysis, we are made for love, and it it is only love that can save us as human beings. And I think therein lies the answer to the question, what transfigured Jesus? It was the love of his Father being poured into him as he went on to that mountain to pray, to be in communion with him. And the other day, I was, had a pretty long conversation with an exorcist. Well, finally, I get some heads to turn up. They're like, enough with this love stuff. Like, <laughs> let's talk about the devil. All right. You know, but it was very interesting. He told me that he had a revelation when he began working with possessed persons. He said he came to understand something about what it means to be human that he never really fully comprehended before said, as human beings, the very ontology of our being, like the very makeup, the essence of who we are, are beings created by God for love. We were made to be loved, to be in communion with Him. Like a human being in the very rawest form, when you take everything else away, we're created to be loved by another. And it's only in that being loved that we find the fulfillment of our being to know ourselves as the beloved of the Father. That's why, you know, even hardcore rappers make love songs. Like Eminem, even he needs to feel loved. And it's expressed in their music. We all naturally intuit what that Jewish man said. The salvation of man is in love and through love. To know ourselves as the beloved of the Father. So why speak about this, though, in light of the diabolical and exorcisms? Well, the exorcist was telling me that he explained that the nature, the fundamental nature of the diabolical are fundamentally those who have rejected the love of God. They chose rather to know themselves as separated from God, as independent, solitary beings, sufficient unto themselves, rather than in cre- rather than creatures in need of the love of the father and their primary goal on this earth is to tempt human beings into that same rebellion 
to make us seek the salvation of love that we're all looking for in the things of this earth rather than in God. To seek the answer to my incompleteness, my need to feel loved in creatures rather than the Creator. That's the fundamental temptation of life. And the thing about the demons is they don't care what it is. There's a motto that I've heard from so many exorcists. They said, the one motto of the demonic is anything but God. What we fill our emptiness with means nothing to them as long as it's not God. Their only goal is to get us separated from God. And whatever does that separation is fine with them. So it could be money. It could be identifying myself by my work or by my status. Or it could be by sports or Netflix, just covering up the need for alcohol or drugs. It could be promiscuous relationships or pornography. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters to them is that we're separated from the one source that can give us the love that we were made for, the love that we were created for. To know myself as anything except the beloved of the Father. That's their goal. So what transfigured Jesus on the mountain? It was his absolute receptivity to the love of the Father when he went to pray. Jesus didn't transfigure himself. He was transfigured. It was passive. And what transfigured him was his relationship with the Father. The love that he was receiving from the Father when he went in to pray. It was the feeling the gaze of the Father upon him. It was the voice of the Father speaking to him, the affirmation of the Father saying, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this was true on Mount Tabor, in the same way that it was true even on Calvary. That moment when he would be stripped of everything, his health, his reputation, his success, his friends, even his life, as he hung upon that cross in absolute poverty and abandonment, he still knew himself as the beloved of the Father. And it was for that reason he could still surrender to his Father even there. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he did this for us to show us that no matter, no matter what we go through in life, no matter what is stripping away from us, no matter what we lose, this is the fundamental thing that never changes. Our identity as the beloved of the Father. Because to live in the world is to love so many things, and yet everything is passable. We could lose everything we love on this earth at any moment. But the reason Christ went to the cross was to show us that no matter what we lose in life, that one essential trait for which we were made for all eternity, the love of the Father, that remains. If we're in communion with that, if we know that is the source of my identity, who I am. That is the only love in the end that must define me. Because that is the only love in the end that can save me. Because that, in the end, is the only love that never passes away. It's the foundation. And all we have to do to receive it is surrender to it. To enter into it so we can receive it. And you ever feel like in your life you're just like holding on so tight just to keep things going from day to day. It's like you're holding on to the steering wheel, keeping from going off a cliff. You know, that, that sign, you can feel it in your body when you're taking, trying to control your life so much, you become so rigid. Grace moves us into surrender. Grace moves us into an attitude of receptivity, of let it be done to me according to your word. Like my life is your work, your project, not mine. You know, that's why it's like prayer should be like in a sense of when you go up on a mountain, you know, it's like clear skies or you're at the beach and the sun is just shining on you. What's your natural reaction to that? 
It's like you, you close your eyes, you open up your arms, and you just become receptivity to that energy pouring out upon you. That's what prayer is. That's what the movement of grace does to us. That's why all the images of the mystics, what they would do when they'd go into ecstasy and have visions of God, their whole being relaxes and they become pure receptivity. That's why so often when we see the Blessed Virgin Mary, images of her, you'll see her arms are open. It's an expression of her whole being. She who was filled perfectly with grace. She was absolute receptivity to the love that was always being poured out into her by the Heavenly Father through the Holy Spirit. And what's really interesting is that exact opposite thing happens in exorcisms. If you really want to like, get your spiritual life on a high, be present at an exorcism sometime. Put it on your to-do list before you, before you pass. As a priest is performing an exorcism on a person, what happens when the spirit manifests itself in the body of that individual is their whole being becomes like rigor mortis. All their joints become stiff and they close up into themselves and they become immovable, impassable. And it's an expression of the nature of the diabolical. It's because their whole being is closed off to God. Their absolute negation of love, just as the saints, the Blessed Virgin Mary and Christ, are absolute re receptivity of love. You see the difference there? And then the whole goal of the diabolical is to tempt us into the same rejection, to close ourselves off from the invitation of God, to go our own way, to do our own thing, to know ourselves by our own self-made standards in life. That's a fight we all have to go through every day. We're all made for love, and that's why we can all say with that man, the salvation of man is through love and in love. That's the truth. But we stand on this earth in between two possibilities. The receptivity of the saints in Christ or the negation of the diabolical. We have to choose which way we follow. So the question we can ask ourselves, and I really ponder this as we go through the Mass, from where am I seeking the love I hope to save me? From where are you seeking the love you hope to save you, to fill your emptiness? And the answer is revealed in how much you pray. When was Jesus transfigured? When he went up the mountain to pray. That's the indisputable sign of where we are seeking our salvation. The, the time that we spend in prayer. That's why the saints would say two things. One, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy so that you don't have the time to enter into that intimacy with God. And St. Alphonse de Liguori would say, when he was asked, who will be saved in the end? He said, those who pray will be saved. Those who do not pray will be lost. Simply because if I'm not praying, if I'm not allowing my heart to be filled with the love of the Father, the love that I was made for, then what am I going to do? I need to be loved. I need to feel myself loved. And if I'm not receiving it from Him, then I'm going to go out into the world and I'm going to seek my identity. I'm going to seek the source of my salvation in the things of this world. And remember, the devil doesn't care what it is. The one motto of the diabolical is anything except God. So understand yourself according to your job. Understand yourself according to your money. Understand yourself according to the people you know, your status, or how many friends we have on Facebook. Understand yourself according to the sports you watch. They would even want you to identify yourself with your sin. The only identity that God gives us is His beloved. That's our fundamental identity. And that means that who we are, we become who we are 
when we're in relationship to that love, that one love that never passes away. And sin, the definition of sin is to miss the mark. Just like if you're, I was shooting uh, clay pigeons with some prisoners yesterday, and I was sinning a lot because I kept missing, you know. Sin means to miss the mark. It means that your heart is made for God in eternity as the source and summit of your, of your salvation. But to, to sin means to seek my salvation, my love, my ultimate meaning in the things of this world before God. And it's, we know we're doing that when we stop praying every day on our knees. Lent, this Lent, is a perfect time to reevaluate my heart, to see what do I need to let go of in my day to day that I'm holding so tight on to so that I can enter into prayer, into that receptivity of the Father that's always being offered to me. So just ask yourself what's making you too busy to pray? One rosary every day, or to come to adoration at least on the first Fridays or on Mondays, to meditate on the Word of God every single day. Just as you eat food every single day, your heart needs that same nourishment. And if you're not getting it from God, you're going to seek it from somewhere else. What do you need to let go of so that you can enter into that intimacy with God? Or another way to ask the same question, from where are you seeking every day the love you hope to save you? Whatever it is, may you find the strength to let it go and to surrender as you come forward to receive the only love that could ever satisfy the deepest longings of your being. The love of the Father as He looks upon us and says, You are my beloved. In you I am well pleased. And by saying that, the means by which He says that is by feeding us with the body, blood, soul, and divinity of His Son. It's then that we become clothed in Christ. His Spirit comes into us. And those same words that were spoken to Him on that mountain can echo in our own hearts. All we have to do is let go so that we can receive.